Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit the subscribe button for more great true crime content. Today's episode is from Studying Scarlet. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe to Studying Scarlet and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. There's the scarlet thread of murder running through the colorless skein of life. And our duty is to unravel it and isolate it and expose every inch of it. Welcome to the Studying Scarlet Podcast. Hi, thanks for joining us for another True Crime Tuesday. I'm Ashley Rosewood. And I'm Jessica Charisse. And together, we're hilarious and sexy. Now that we've lifted you up, let's tear you way the fuck down and put you in a basement of shame from which you cannot escape. I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm here for it. I want to let you know that while I'm very rarely sorry for what we do on this podcast, I'm a little bit sorry, like maybe 5% sorry about how sad I'm about to make you. Oh gosh, here we go. I know, 5% is a lot for me. That's good. Because this week's topic... Oh, wait, um, trigger warning if you don't like airplanes. Is that like a thing? I don't like airplanes. I hate flying. Well, then why didn't you tell me not to do this before I researched? <laughs> because it should be talked about. Okay. Do it. <laughs> so this, this week's true crime topic is the disappearance of Malaysian 370. <sighs> Before you get into it, correct me if I'm wrong, but we still don't know what happened to that plane today. Techni- technically, no. Have they found it? No. Okay. They I found so. pieces of it. Okay. Just, I thought you're, so. You're skip- don't, no, I'm don't sorry. I, just, I apologize. Okay. Don't get in here and rush me. I'm because sorry. Because this is a depressing roller coaster that needs to follow the proper course. That's fair. All right. So um, I used three sources essentially for most of the material that I'm going to use. I just want to credit those up front before I get too deep into it and forget. Um, I use two different documentaries. One is an Australian documentary that came out in 2014 called Lost, colon, MH370. I know I didn't need to say the colon, but it happened. (laughs) I'll take it back. I probably would have too, so. And the second one, and this part's a little confusing, so bear with me was a 2015 documentary that was released that appears to have two different titles, which I don't at all understand. Um, The actual image that's on IMDb and the image that I saw on Amazon, which is where I watched it because these are both on Prime Video, says the Enigma of Flight MH370, but the actual title they show on IMDb is MH370's Enigma. That's weird. So the same, but fucking different. Okay. So I'm going to go Sean Spencer and say I've heard it both ways. (laughs) And the main source that I used for the bulk of this, to be perfectly honest, is a really great article from The Atlantic that came out in July 2019. Uh, The article is called Vanished, How Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 Disappeared. And that's by William, bear with me because it's German, William... Longa Visha. I think that's right. And I'm going to get better at saying that as we go along, I swear. German names are hard. German names are hard. Actually, a lot of things about Germany are hard. But their food is good. That's debatable. <laughs> well, they're probably German. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to insult you, Germany. I am German, so I'm really sorry. Hashtag same. Hashtag money. <laughs> Okay, we have to stop hashtagging. We really it's do. getting weird. It really is. So, the background information on this, if you're a little foggy on the details, are that Jess is pointing to herself. I didn't mean to laugh, but it happened. <laughs> I didn't think you saw me. <laughs> so I did see you peripherally. Okay, it, it totally threw me off, but it's okay. So, the plane disappeared on March 8th, 2014. So, by the time this episode actually comes out, we will have been six years since this happens. Wow. Um, It was a Boeing 777. So that's a sizable plane. If you're someone who knows anything about aviation, you're probably judging me and being like, "Eh, fuck you. I know exactly how many people that seats. Guess what? I don't. 
And I don't need to know. Because <laughs> I'm here for the crime. Right. Um, it was departing the Kuala Lumpur International Airport, which is in Malaysia. And its final destination was going to be Beijing, China. That is approximately a six hour flight, give or take. And it was slated for a 6.30 a.m. arrival time. The plane had passed its maintenance check just 12 days before this, so it was in good working condition, at least at the time that it was checked. And the conditions, the flying conditions on March 8th were near perfect. Like it was a clear night, no disturbances, no storms, nothing. Hmm. Like really good visibility, <clears throat> pretty much anything you could want if you're a pilot or a passenger. Was there a gremlin on the wing? There was not, but that's Jess's way of hinting that the Fiction Friday that's going to follow this episode is the Twilight Zone. I really wasn't trying to hint at that. It happened. But, it, okay. <laughs> Freud. Actually, no, Freud would be like penises. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I have deviated from the plan. That's about right. So we're going to be, yeah, while we're talking about it, we are going to be doing the Nightmare at 30,000 Feet, which is the newer version uh, for the Twilight yes, Zone. Because there is a crying featured in that episode. But we are actually also probably going to draw some fun comparisons to Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, just because I really love that episode. And I want to make sure I rewatch it so that I, I can both, have so. fresh, awesome jokes for you. Oh, yeah, that will not be funny because I am not funny. Okay, back to what I was doing. The plane had approximately 49 tons of fuel on board, which is enough for about eight hours of flight in normal conditions, which as I've already stated, they definitely had normal conditions. So they could have gotten maximum life out of that fuel. Holy crap, 49 tons for eight hours? Yeah. Damn. Boy, it's a big heavy, it's a, yeah, like it's, when it's I a say, sizable it's, when I say it's a big plane, like it's a big fucking plane. Yeah. Um, there were 12 crew members on board and a total of 227 passengers from 14 different countries. I'm not going to name every single one, but those countries included China. That's where most of the passengers were from. Malaysia, Australia, France, the U.S. I think there were only like two people from the U.S. on board and Canada. So really, when I say the bulk of the people were from China, I think it was like 150 wow. of the 227 were from China. So um, I'm going to kind of take a layered approach to telling this story because I feel like just going right for the jugular is going to make everyone way too fucking depressed. So we're going to try to build up to it in layers so that we can all be sad, but like gradually, like when you put a frog in boiling water. Don't do that. Don't boil a frog. Actually, you know what? Some people eat frogs. Okay, but make sure it's not alive. When you you know who eats frogs? Baby Yoda. Friends. Baby Yoda eats frogs. <laughs> I was like, friends. <laughs> and they're definitely alive. They are. Because they're still twitching. Baby Yoda is rude. He shouldn't eat frogs. I love Baby Yoda. He can do whatever he wants. He can, but he shouldn't eat frogs. So the flight um, took off at 12.42 a.m. That's right. No segue. The flight took off <laughs> at 12.42 a.m. from Kuala Lumpur. And um, really the mystery part of this, we're going to jump forward to 1.19 a.m. Because that's when things start to go from routine to odd. Mm. So at 1.19 a.m., the plane was flying at 35,000 feet. That's pretty much optimal cruising height for this plane. That's my understanding. I'm not an aviation expert. Um, but the plane was approaching Vietnam's airspace at this point in the flight. And the... I'm sorry. The... Um, Jesus. Air traffic control. Why could I not think of that? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Air traffic control um, in Malaysia directed them in this part of its routine they directed them to change to Ho Chi Minh's radio frequency because that's where air traffic control was located in Vietnam. Okay. Final radio contact with Malaysian air traffic control happened at this time when the pilot said good night Malaysian 370. Okay, this is creepy because this is really starting to sound like the actual nightmare on 30,000 feet episode and it's really freaking me out. Holy shit. So that's the last anyone ever heard from them. 
ever again. Wow, I wonder if he took from the Malaysian disappearance. He probably did, but the other thing to keep in mind is that apparently that's not an atypical sign-off. Oh, really? For a nighttime flight. He's saying goodnight to this air traffic control. Okay. And identifying them by their their flight number. Right. Because he's supposed to switch over and greet air traffic control in Ho Chi Minh City. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So that's a fairly typical sign-off. It only seems really fucking creepy because it's the last thing anyone will ever hear from this plane. Wow. 90 seconds later, at 1.21 a.m., the plane's transponder stops communicating. So the plane disappears from secondary radar. So one second, it's on a radar screen and air traffic control identified. Mm -hmm. The next second, it's gone. It's just not on the radar at all. No. Like it just literally blipped out of existence. Well, so here's the thing. There's two kinds of radar, and I learned this researching this. There's primary radar and there's secondary radar. Okay. Commercial flights rely on secondary radar, and the reason is because a transponder can give you a lot of information about the plane. Like, it can tell you its cruising height, its location, which is the primary thing that they're looking at on radar. Um, So, like, what airspace it's in, that's how they would have known they were approaching Vietnamese airspace. So it gives a lot of detailed information, and that's why they use that. Primary radar would still be able to detect the plane, but air traffic control doesn't use primary radar. You know who does? Mm. Military bases, and that's gonna become a thing in a couple minutes. The only thing is when you rely on primary radar, since you're not getting all that data from the transponder, is that it comes up as an unidentified plane Mm. instead of showing up identified by its call sign. Right, that's interesting. So nobody apparently noticed that it just disappeared from radar, which to be honest, kind of does make sense because you're in air traffic control at a busy goddamn airport. Mm. So you're not just sitting there watching one plane. You're watching so You're well. watching a bunch of planes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you so, probably just look over and go, wait a minute. <laughs> so they didn't notice it immediately, which I can kind of understand. Okay. The next <clears throat> anomaly is that at 1.30 say, Wow, 137 <laughs> a.m. The A cars on the plane failed to send any data from the flight back to air traffic control. A cars stands for Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System, and this system is designed to automatically send information at 30 minute intervals. So it has even more detailed information than you can get from the transponder, but unlike the transponder, because of the amount of data it sends back, it doesn't do it continuously. It sends a report every 30 minutes. Now I could be completely wrong at making this comparison, but is it kind of like a black box? No. It's not? No. I am completely wrong at making that comparison. Black boxes are totally different. Okay, so I don't know jack shit about airplanes. So we're gonna get back to black boxes when we get- Oh, sorry to the end of the story. Um, so anyway, the flight's last ACARS message was received at 1.07 a.m. So it would have been due to send the next one, like I said, at 1.37 a.m. and that does not happen. That means we know that sometime between 1.07 a.m. and 1.37 a.m. the system was disabled. Okay. Now my guess is that it was probably right around 1.21 a.m when the transponder was turned off. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that. That is speculation, my friend. It's speculation, but it's it's not a bad um, speculate. It's not a bad speculate. <laughs> <laughs> so at 1.41 a.m., after a 20 minute delay, Vietnamese air traffic control from Ho Chi Minh finally notifies Kuala Lumpur that MH370 failed to make radio contact. Mm -hmm. That's extremely unusual, guys. This plane should have checked in with them within minutes of switching off Mm -hmm. from talking to Malaysian air traffic control, and that didn't happen. Like, realistically, this should have been reported within a matter of maybe like five minutes. And Mm -hmm. instead, they wait 20 minutes to report it. Yeah, that's weird. So I don't have an explanation for why that happened, 
but they waited probably four times as long as they should have to report that the contact didn't come through. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to hear an even fucking bigger delay? Sure. Malaysian Airlines finally attempts to contact MH370 via satellite phone at 2.40 a.m. That's like an hour later. I would be on the phone going, hey, are you guys okay? Like, what's going on? So, yeah, 59 minutes between wow. when they f hear from Ho Chi Minh that the flight never checked in to when they try to contact the plane. And that's five minutes after they reported false position coordinates in one of their air traffic control logs that indicated the plane was in Cambodian airspace, which it never fucking was. That's... Exactly. It's fucking weird. <sighs> <laughs> I'm just saying that plane is in the same place as Amelia Earhart. The pregnant size of irritation from questions I cannot answer. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I don't expect you to know everything. No, uh, it's not possible. So, they tried, again, and I'm going to repeat this, at 2.40 a.m. they finally tried to contact the plane. At 5.30 a.m., Air Search and Rescue is finally notified. That was almost three hours. It's a long fucking time. That's like a football game. Is it? Yeah. I don't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, everyone's turning this off now. No, Fuck not. her for not watching football. I, probably half the people that listen to this don't even watch football. It's fine. Eh, I don't know. At 6.30 a.m., the plane fails to land in Beijing, so now the public knows that something's wrong because if anyone was waiting to greet these people in the Beijing airport, they're not there. At 7.24 a.m., Malaysia Airlines releases a media statement saying that radio contact had been lost with the flight at 2.40 a.m. That's a fucking lie. That's exactly a lie. That is an hour and 21 minutes differentiation from when the last radio contact actually occurred at 1.19 a.m. Wow. Once, That's a strange thing to lie about. Oh, you're oh, going to fucking better. hear okay. some strange things to lie about. <laughs> so, following the recognition that the plane was lost, search efforts were focused in the South China Sea during the crucial early phases of looking for this, what at that point was presumed to be a wreckage. They didn't find it. And guess what? Mm -hmm. They're looking in the wrong fucking place. By a lot. By like one mile or several miles? Oh, <laughs> by being on the wrong fucking side of the country. That is really, really, really wrong. That is so many miles. It's a lot of miles. Oh my god. So what the hell happened? And at this point, let's really start getting into the article from The Atlantic because this, I cannot stress enough how solid the information is in this article. It's fucking amazing. So the data that we have on what happened during all these windows when there was no radar communication and no ACARS messaging coming back comes from three different sources. Two of them are from military bases, which again use primary radar. So the plane would have shown up on their radar at these two bases. Mm -hmm. It just would have shown up as an unidentified plane. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, if you're monitoring a radar at a fucking military base, you're supposed to check on random unidentified planes that fly over you. That's one of the whole reasons they have radar in the first place. No one fucking does that. I wonder if it was shot down by a missile. Uh, no. The answer okay. to that question is a big, massive no, but there. we'll get there. Um, the third source that we have information from is actually from a private company called Inmarsat that has, that owns a bunch of satellites and has a ground station in Perth, Australia, which is the station that picked up the information from the flight. Okay. So what fucking happened? Well, at 1.30 a.m., so that's about nine minutes after the transponder was switched off, the plane took a wide left turn off course. This turn could only have been executed manually, so the plane was not on autopilot. Someone actively was flying this plane when this turn was made. Hmm. 
At this point, the flight path kind of roughly follows the border between Thailand and Malaysia, which is a good fucking statistical move if you're about to suddenly take a plane off course, because anytime a plane is kind of over a border between countries, people kind of have more questions about where the plane is coming from and where it's going because it's unclear which airspace the plane is actually going to be in, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. <clears throat> This course changes what took them into the airspace of the two different military bases. Both bases breached military protocol by not investigating the unidentified plane, which I've already angrily pointed out, mm -mm. and it would have been visible on military radar for how long do you think, Jess? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I would think it would... As long as it was flying over their airspace, it would be on the radar. So. It should have been visible on radar between those two bases for up to 45 minutes. Okay. So it's not like they had five minutes to respond to this. They had a significant 45. amount of time. Almost and, an hour. And nothing gets done. So the plane firmly would have been outside of that visible airspace at about 2.25 a.m. Okay. At which point the plane's satellite box returns to activity. Now, what that means is that most likely the full electrical system of the plane is restored at this time. So probably around the same time that all that other stuff got shut off, they shut down more parts of the electrical system as well. The reason that we know that the satellite box returned to activity is because it sent a login request to the Inmarsat satellite at 2.25 a.m. So mm -hmm. it came back up and it sent that request automatically. Now the satellite accepted that and that accomplished the first of seven link-ups with that satellite. Um, sometimes those are referred to as handshakes. So if I use the word handshake going forward, I mean those link-ups, those blips between the two satellite box. I mean, the satellite box and the actual satellite. I'm sorry. That was wrong. So this ended up providing analysts with a series of seven arcs, providing a general location for the plane during its continued flight, as long as it was communicating with that satellite. So thanks to this data, we know that the plane after it finished crossing the Malay Peninsula made a final turn to the northeast and then made a final run that due to the straightness of those handshakes, those arcs that I was talking about, it looks like the plane was probably put back on autopilot after that turn. Hmm. But it continued to fly until 8.19 a.m. Hmm. That's when the last contact between the satellite and the plane happened, and at this point the plane would have run out of fuel. Okay. Inmarsat provided this data to the Malaysian government to aid them in their search efforts, but the government continued searching in the South China Sea, a location proven to be utterly incorrect by that Inmarsat data, mm -hmm. and they did not publicly acknowledge even receiving any of this information from Inmarsat until March 24th. Yikes. The plane was lost on the 8th. They continued searching the South China Sea, and then weeks later, they were like, oh, by the way, families who are desperately hoping will find your loved ones somehow still, yeah, we've had this information for a while, and we're looking in the wrong spot. That was a full 16 days. It was. So, they were looking in the wrong spot on purpose? Was it on purpose? I, I don't, don't know. I mean, I'm asking. Like, I don't it know. sounds to me like, oh, we knew it was the wrong spot, but we kept looking there anyway. Or are they just incompetent? I mean, there's that too. They could be just incompetent. And that's how we got sued by the Malaysian government and shut down. So, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question, basically, is what I'm saying. They continued searching there, and really... The search effort was largely being led by Australian forces because they had the people and were close enough to be helping assist in this effort. So how much of that information was conveyed to the actual searchers is a big question mark. And why they would have chosen not to communicate that, mm -hmm. 
I can't answer, but I can say that the only possible scenario is that it has to be something kind of shady, even if we're just talking about being incompetent. Okay. So there were three official in investigations. The first one is that Australian underwater search effort that I just mentioned. That lasted for three years and cost over $160 million. Wow. <clears throat> Assisting in that investigation was a volunteer effort by a group of engineers and scientists who came together on the internet and had this really successful invested collaboration. Um, they passed on information that proved to be very useful to the official investigators. This volunteer group refers to themselves as the independent group and they will come up again. So try to remember independent group, okay. internet volunteers. Okay. The second official investigation was basically the Malaysian police who did background checks on everyone aboard MH370, as well as some of their friends, family members, associates, that sort of thing, to try to figure out if anyone on board might have been involved in the plane's disappearance. Or a exactly. Right. If it was a sabotage or a hijacking, exactly. That report was ultimately stamped secret and withheld from the public and from other Malaysian investigators. Excellent. Excellent. So we don't even know a lot about what they fucking found, and neither did other people. Oh, this is going well. Isn't it, though? Isn't it, though? Finally, there was the accident inquiry. Now, this was intended to find the probable cause. <laughs> I typed probably cause. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it autocorrected it. Probable cause of the flight's disappearance. Wow, I'm a dummy. Um, and this is led by an ad hoc, and by the way, ad hoc means, like, created for a specific purpose. So this okay. panel of people was created solely to do this investigation. And this working group was assembled by the Malaysian government, but this was widely acknowledged to be a huge mess from the beginning. I like to think of them as a dumpster fire, but <laughs> that's just me being myself. <laughs> the country of Malaysia is so angry at us right now. Uh, they don't care. Mm. They're like, you know what? They're right. We They're probably say. like, well, you know what? You're not fucking wrong because we do not know what happened to this plane. Um, an unnamed source who we're told was a close observer of the investigative process told the reporter from The Atlantic, quote, it became clear that the primary objective of the Malaysians was to make the subject just go away. Hmm. From the start, there was this instinctive bias against being open and transparent, not because they were hiding some deep, dark secret, <clears throat> but because they did not know where the truth really lay, and they were afraid that something might come out that would be embarrassing. Were they covering up? Yes, they were covering up for the unknown. Exactly. Frustrating. Frustrated sigh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the report that was ultimately released by this accident inquiry um, did not come out until July 2018, and there was really only one good contribution from that report, which was the description of the ATC failures. So that's how we know so much about the air traffic control side of things. Mm -hmm. But the cause of the plane's loss, which again was their primary objective, their whole purpose was to figure out why the plane went missing. Yeah, they listed it as undetermined. So let's get into some possible theories. Um, the 2015 documentary that I talked about that has two different fucking titles. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, they offer three potential types of explanation for the disappearance of the plane. Um, well, three categories. Let's call them categories. I think that's a little bit better. So category number one is possible technical problem. And they give two different scenarios under this umbrella. The first one is fire. So the main source of the fire theory is that there are supposedly three eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the plane, like, still in the sky, but on fire. Oh, my God. But the location that these witnesses port reported seeing this plane in the sky on fire in, that doesn't fit with what we know about the flight path based on 
the military radar and the Inmarsat data. So there is a plane that was on fire, and we have no idea what plane that was. Or there was no plane that was on fire. And they were all just on acid. I mean, I'm not saying they were on acid, but I'm saying I, like, don't know how great of a view that you can possibly get of a plane from, like, being on a boat in the ocean. Oh, they were on a boat. I'm sorry. I must have missed that part. I think one of them was on an oil rig. Uh But you know what I mean? They're, like, in the ocean. That's true. So I feel like with the way the sun, like, hits the water and shit sometimes, I'm not sure how well you'd be able to tell if a plane that's, like, 30,000 feet in the air is on fire. Okay. I don't know why, but I assumed that these witnesses saw it at night, and I have no idea why I thought that at all. Well, because it took off at night, and, like, it's possible that Maybe. it still would have been dark out, but... It probably would have been dawn. At but here's point. the thing, like, the plane we know for sure was still flying by 8, 19 a.m. Yeah. So that also doesn't really make sense, because no plane has ever stayed in the air with a major fire on board for more than, like, 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So how the fuck did this plane stay flying for more than seven and a half hours? And also, if there was a fire, why did they just completely decide to change direction? Completely change their course, make no effort to do like an emergency landing. Yeah, it doesn't really make true. sense. Yeah. So it sounds good until you think about it. Yeah. Um, the next idea is depressurization. Um, And the suggestion is that if that happened kind of gradually, maybe that would explain what happened. Because depressurization would cause everyone aboard to lose consciousness because of lack of oxygen. They did that in the Twilight Zone episode (laughs) 2! Oh my god! I I wasn't, like, raising my hand. I was just like, can you believe this? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I know some of you are probably like, what about those oxygen masks that fall down? Well, Newsflash and I just fucking found this out, so I was, like, two days ago, years old, when I found out (laughs) those oxygen masks only have enough air for 15 minutes. Really? Not even fucking kidding. I am this today, right now, in this minute, years old when I discovered that. I did not know that. So they'll help you, but on a really limited basis. So those oxygen masks are bullshit. Well, the idea is that if the plane's depressurizing like that, you're supposed to make an emergency landing. So you only should need the oxygen long enough for the plane to land somewhere. That's fair. So yeah, so those masks really wouldn't do shit, but the depressurization like theory has kind of similar problems to the theory about the fire, which is like, why the hell did the flight path change so drastically? Doesn't make any sense. And also, if it's depressurization, like maybe a fire I might understand interfering with the transponder in the AR yeah. system, depending mm-hmm. on where it happened. Right. But fucking depressurization doesn't just make your transponder not work. It, it could almost explain why it sharply veered off course. Because, like, if it depressurized everything, like, including, you know, the the pilot's the nose of the plane. Which I know it doesn't. But no, I'm the cockpit like, has a totally different style. Cockpit! I said nose of the plane. Look at me. Plane nose. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, like, unless maybe it was just suddenly, like, deep, and he just, like, passed out over the... But yeah, I guess that's not possible. No, the the pressurization in the cockpit's very different. We are gonna talk more about that in a little bit, I keep jumping ahead accidentally. No, it's totally (laughs) fine. It's totally fine. Like, it might change... It might explain changing your flight path, but only if you're gonna do an emergency fucking landing. And if you're only, like, that far off Mm -hmm. from your takeoff point, it really would make a lot more sense to try to turn around than to just be like, I'm gonna veer and go between Malaysia and Thailand for a really long time. Just cause I can. (laughs) Why the fuck not? I got nothing better to do. (laughs) So the second category of explanation is hijacking, but I added slash terrorism. I, I mean, maybe that's not necessary, but you know what I mean. So that might explain the altered flight path for sure, because if someone's going to take over a plane, they're going to be like, we're going to fucking fly over here. Mm -hmm. So that could make sense. And also it might explain the tracking systems being turned off Mm -hmm. because you don't really want people to know where you're going if Mm -hmm. you're stealing a plane pretty much. Yeah. 
The other thought is that if this were sort of like a 9-11 style hijacking, the plan could have been to, pla to actually crash the plane into a designated target, and there were some targets that they thought, well, these might fit with the changed flight plan. Now, you might be asking yourself, okay, if that's the case, why didn't the plane crash into those things? Well, if the passengers revolted like they did on, like, United 93, maybe that would explain why the plane didn't make it to the target. So, yeah. there is still some room for this to be a possibility. And this actually, by the way, is the theory that's favored in the official report from the accident inquiry. But again, they ultimately said the cause was undetermined. Right. So, possible perpetrators, if, that, if this were a hijacking scenario. Um, there were 20 employees on board this flight of the company Freescale, which is a defense industry contractor. So some people are like, oh, that's suspicious. Maybe one or some of them, since they're involved in defense. Mm -hmm. I personally think that's really not a great idea. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a lot of fucking conspirators, for one thing. Yeah. I also think it's a coincidence, but that's just me. The other thing is that there were two Iranian passengers on board the plane who boarded with stolen passports under false identities. Okay. But it turns out through investigation that these men were actually asylum seekers who wanted to go to Germany. Ah, okay. So I think we can all agree that, yes, it's kind of suspicious that they had stolen passports yeah. and that they used false identities, right. but there's also probably some racial profiling happening because they're like, well, they're Iranian, so they did it. They didn't yeah. fucking do it, guys. Right. It's not them. Um, some witnesses claim to have seen the plane near the Maldives, um, which would have suggested a possible target there, which is the U.S.-based Diego Garcia. Hmm. But the problem is that the Maldives don't fit with the data that we have from Inmarsat about the plane's flight path. So those witnesses probably saw a different plane. Okay. Finally, and this is probably the biggest thing for me, no terrorist group has ever claimed responsibility for taking this plane. And they would have by and now. And they would have. Like, that's just a big thing. The whole... Like, if you're going to be a terrorist group, you need to strike fear into people. That's yeah. the whole point That's of the terrorism. Whole point. The whole point is to take credit of the terror. Like Exactly. You want to be like, we fucking did this. This is how powerful we are. This is what we're capable of. We took this fucking plane. That has never happened. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I guess I'll mention this too, even though I technically said that was my last thing. The other thing is... That unless the hijacking was like an inside job, it'd be kind of difficult to gain access to the cockpit because this is post 9-11. This would happen 13 years later. Well, yeah. 12 and a half years later because it's March. What year was it? 2014? Yeah. Okay. So it's like 12 and a half years later. So the cockpit actually had a high security electrically bolted fortified door separating it from the cabin of the plane. Holy shit. And that door also has continuous video surveillance, which the pilots would be able to see. Okay. So if anyone comes up and tries to get in the door, even if they would like take someone hostage and try to get in that way, the pilots would be able to see what they're doing. So that's another wrench in that plan. So the easiest way to gain entry would be for it to be an inside job, but all of the cabin crew members on the plane were also cleared through investigation. So you might be like, well, how good was that fucking investigation? Because we know some aspects of this were not really up to the standards we would have expected is the nicest way I can think of to yeah. say it. But... Um, the team that did the background checks was a team of Malaysian and Chinese investigators who were aided by the FBI. Hmm. And those people were also good enough to figure out that the Iranians had boarded under stolen passports and figure out who those people really were. Mm -hmm. So there was a decent amount of depth to, depth to this. So once all of those people are cleared, we're really only left with 
two possibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of who would have been flying the plane, we're only left with two possibilities for who could have done this, and that's the pilot and the co-pilot. Mm -hmm. So the third theory, then, is suicide. Oh my god. Well, it's happened before, though. Has it? Yeah. Other pilots have committed suicide by deliberately crashing their planes in, like, large-scale murder-suicides. It's happened before. With a plane full of people? It's happened before. I'm never flying again. I mean, it's not common, oh, Jeff, shit. but it's happened. The only thing is... Oh, my God. Well, the only thing is that MH370 doesn't look like the suicides we know about that happen that way. Okay. Because they usually happen really quickly. Mm. And that makes sense if you think about it, because if you're on a plane with a bunch of other people on board and you're going to do something like fucking crash the plane on purpose and kill everybody, odds are at least one person on that plane is not going to like that plan. So you're going to need to do it quickly. Unless you depressurize first and then crash the plane so nobody screams. I mean, even then, you have a pilot and a co-pilot that are both in the cockpit. It doesn't look like a typical suicide by plane, but that doesn't uh -huh. mean it wasn't. Right. That's awful. Oh my God. So while the security door to the cockpit would provide some additional time, if somebody from outside the cockpit wanted to stop you, they'd have to get through that. Since the plane stayed in the air for seven hours after the transponder was switched off, that is more than enough time for someone to break down that door. Like, it is fortified, it is a very strong door, but fucking holding up to seven hours of people trying to beat down a door, it's gonna give eventually. Yeah. It's not Fort Knox, it's a fucking plane. It's just a door. So, of our two people who would have been in the cockpit, the co-pilot, Farik Abdul Hamid, is considered very unlikely to have been suicidal. Mm-hmm. He was extremely close to completing his training and becoming a full pilot. So he was about to get a very big promotion, a pay raise, and actually pilots in Malaysia generally are held in fairly high regard. Like it's considered a good job to have. So okay. it's reputable. Yeah. He was also relatively young and had recently gotten engaged. Okay. So it seems like his life was kind of on an upswing. Mm -hmm. And of course, that doesn't mean it's impossible for him to have been suicidal. Sure. I mean, just think about Kate Spade. She had an incredibly great life. That's right. yeah. Robin Williams had mm -hmm. an incredibly great life. But if you're um, depressed... Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, Anthony yeah. Bourdain. So you can have all the things in the world. But if you're deeply depressed and suicidal, you might still kill yourself. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's impossible... I'm just saying he's not considered to be likely. It doesn't look likely that that's what happened. So the pilot, Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah, raises more questions. Hmm. He did have over 18,000 hours of flight experience and was a 30-year veteran of Malaysia Air. So he was an older guy. He was in his 50s. I'm sorry. He was the pilot? And the younger guy was the co-pilot. Was the co-pilot, okay, yeah. Sorry. Okay. And he was technically also that younger guy's, like, trainer, sort okay, of. gotcha. Because he was still finishing his training. That's why he was a co-pilot. Gotcha. I, that's what I figured. I just, I don't know why in my head that it got weird. So, supposedly, he has, in that 30 years, an unblemished service record. Okay. So, none of that really suggests anything negative. Sure. So let's get into the suspicious part of this. Oh, God. Media reports in the aftermath of the plane's disappearance mm -hmm. painted Zahari as depressed with a failing marriage and possibly unfit to fly on March 8th. Uh-oh. <sighs> it's alleged that his wife left him less than 24 hours before. Oh, God. In the 2014 Australian documentary I watched, um, that's the one that's called Lost, MH370. Just one title. Just one, not two. <laughs> Zahari's brother-in-law is interviewed, and I just want to say that he denies all of this. Oh, okay. Because I think I need to give due process to everything. Yeah. So the brother-in-law denies that there were any marital problems between Zahari and his wife. And he says that it was routine for the wife to stay elsewhere when Zahari would do overnight flights. Gotcha. She probably didn't like staying by herself. It's possible. 
So, um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And honestly, overall, this theory is just not supported by any of Zahari's surviving family members. Oh, so okay. I do want to say that his actual family denies all of this. They say that it's not true. Okay. Just to be fair. Um, I also feel like it's worth noting that Zahari was Muslim in faith. Mm -hmm. So there could be some unfair profiling happening. I literally was just about to say something about, like, does that mean suicide is like the ultimate sin in the Muslim religion? And then you said that and I went, I'm stupid. Oh no, it's like a profiling thing. Like, because people have negative ideas about Muslims because of terrorist events like 9-11. Yeah. So I just want to try to be as fair as I can and say there are reasons that it it's very possible that it wasn't, but it doesn't look great when the whole case is laid out. So mm -hmm. let's get there. Oh God. Okay. So additional details have come to light since then. So again, it's been about six years now since the plane disappeared. The wreckage still has never been found. Mm -hmm. So some conspiracy theorists argue that because we never found the plane, that means the Inmarsat data is false. Like, that it's made up. That because be if that data were correct, they're saying we should have found the plane by now. Not necessarily. Exactly. We found Amelia Earhart and it's been a long fucking time. Well, I think people need to understand that the ocean is an incredibly difficult place to search. It is. It's a deep as hell, and actually the area where the Australians ended up searching um, is in the Indian Ocean off the coast of... Uh, off the coast. Off the coast, <laughs> even. So... The Inmarsat data says that the plane should have gone down in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Australia, not in the South China Sea. And that is where the search effort was focused after Malaysia was finally like, okay, this isn't the right place for us to be looking. The thing is, that area actually was very difficult to search. It's very deep there. Mm -hmm. And they ended up having to map the topography like underneath the water Doesn't before that, like, they impossible? could even really search. It's incredibly difficult. You need nice. like robots and shit. Yeah. You need high tech equipment. Right. And if there's a, a drop off underneath the water, good luck getting your typography your type typography. Typography is what I said. <laughs> That's about fonts. <laughs> Yes. She means job I, I definitely do mean that. I'm just, I can't talk. So today. I think it's kind of horseshit to be like, well, that data has to be fake because we would have found the plane by now. You're kind of jumping to conclusions there, guys. It's really fucking hard to look in the ocean. P.S. It took 70 years to find the Titanic. Just saying. I know we have better tech now, but it's really fucking hard to find stuff. But it's like, I, can I add to that? Real Absolutely. Fast? Go ahead. Um, Nate and I started watching a show called Expedition Unknown, which is by Josh Gates, and it's a few seasons in, so we just started it. And um, they were searching for Amelia Earhart, I think, and they dove under the water and they actually found the wreckage of a plane that this government had been looking for, but it wasn't Amelia Earhart, it was somebody else. And they're like, we wondered what happened to that plane. So, so this, I mean, this happens. The ocean is just, I think it's very hard for us to comprehend how vast a place the ocean is to search, even if you have rough data that says yeah. approximately where the plane should have been. I think they said there's something like we've only searched about 10% of, of the ocean in the world or something like that. It's it's an insanely small number, so, so who it's, knows? it's just really difficult. It's fast. Um, American Blaine Gibson became fixated with the mystery of MH370, and he actually began traveling to various beaches in the world looking for debris from this plane. First of all, his name is Blaine Gibbons? Gibbons? Gibson. 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 Did I say Gibbons? I don't know. I think you said Gibson. I think I just heard Gibbons for okay. whatever reason. I'm sorry, guys. Blaine Gibson, just in case that I is, misspoke. That is absolutely an adventurer name. It's a cool fucking name. It's right up there with Josh Gates. It's totally an adventure name. Indiana Jones. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 
which I know his name wasn't really Indiana, but it's fine. I named the dog Indiana. All right. <clears throat> All right. Digression over. Um, <laughs> so he, um, so on July 29th, 2015, a municipal beach cleanup crew on the French island of, I don't want to fuck this up, Réunion. It's the best I can do. I didn't sure. take French. <laughs> So it's this French island. They found a torn piece of airfoil and the serial number eventually identified it as coming from MH370. Hmm. It was part of a flapperon, which is one of the wing control surfaces used to reduce aircraft speed for takeoff and landing. Interesting. So after this was found, Blaine Gibson flew to Australia and spoke with two oceanographers at the University of Western Australia to find out, based on this location, where he might search for other debris. Like, if if this washed up here, where else might I find debris from this plane? Okay. And they gave him two places to look. They said the northeast coast of Madagascar and then to a lesser degree of certainty, the coast of Mozambique. So in February 2016, Gibson goes to Mozambique because he likes to go to places he's never been. So he'd never been there before, so he chose that place, even though they said it was less likely. So while he's in Mozambique, um, a local boatman named Suleiman help him, helped him search a sandbank known as Paluma, where they found a gray triangular scrap that was approximately two feet across and had a honeycomb structure on it. And the words, no step, were stenciled on one side. And this turns out to be a stabilizer panel from MH370. And they're absolutely certain that it came from MH370. It's been positively identified, okay. wow. for sure. Hmm. Then in June 2016, Gibson goes to Madagascar and searches along the northeast coast. This trip results in finding eight more pieces of debris in less than two weeks. All of these pieces have been positively identified as coming from MH370. So he found that those in Madagascar? Yeah, they had where next was, eight pieces. Where was the, the other? Mozambique. That's okay. Africa. Just so, because I'm not... I don't know geography for shit. About how far are those? I'm sorry. Are you fucking kidding me? Ugh. Here's the map. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to know how far apart those places are. I, didn't, I don't know if maybe you, you read it and forgot. I'm sorry. Mm, where's this map? You know what? I'm just going to Google it. No, I'm going to. No, just <laughs> chill. I have a fucking map. Okay, all right. I have a map. I just kink the pages apart because I'm panicking because people are waiting. It's in the back section. Just I'll find it. Keep looking for it. It's like a big two-page map. Okay. Okay, so Jazz is looking for her map because I am not a geographer. I'm sorry. But all of this evidence demonstrates that the Inmarsat data seems to be accurate and that the plane would have been lost somewhere in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Australia. Gibson continues to search for debris, and in 2017, he set up a formal transfer system for any new pieces he locates. That system is for him to turn it over to authorities in Madagascar, who then transfer the items to Malaysia's honorary consul, who then ships the items back to Kuala Lumpur for examination and storage. You want to hear another really fucking crazy curveball? Yeah. On August 24th, 2017, that honorary consul who ships the items back to Kuala Lumpur, yeah, he was gunned down by an assassin on a motorcycle, and the killer has never been found. That's not suspicious at all. It's pretty crazy. And just for the record, for those of you that don't know geography like I do, it was Mozambique and Madagascar. Mm -hmm. uh, they are actually not that far apart. Um, so I guess I was hope I was thinking like, is one over here and one's over here? Because that would be weird. But 
No, because like they're around Africa, yeah. so Ge- geographically, it makes sense that they would have found. Um, yeah, and again, that those locations support the idea that the plane did go down okay. in the Indian Ocean off Australia. All right, so here it goes, guys. This is where it's going to get really depressing. So you might want to pause here and like go get yourself a nice vat of ice cream or cookie dough or something. Like, pause. Com- <laughs> listen, comfort food. Pause. Get a drink. Come back to us. Maybe get some whiskey. I don't know what your thing is. Just get something that you find comforting. Maybe you're Linus and you still have your blankie. I'm not judging. Just go get something (laughs) and then come back and join us when you're ready to have your soul crushed because I'm about to do it. And again, I really want to stress that I'm crediting William Langavisha and his article in The Atlantic because everything from here to the end of this comes from that article. It's fucking phenomenal. Read it. It's available online. I'm going to cry. You better be ready. Hold on to your butts. So the disabling of the transponder, transponder, wow, transponder, I should have taken my own advice and paused and gone and gotten a vat of ice cream. (laughs) Sadly, I did not. So the transponder and the A cars on the plane, before the big course deviation, the fact that those were both disabled and then they're like wide fucking turn off course, that essentially tells us the disappearance of this plane was intentional. There's really no way to think like, oh, it was a fucking accident that these crucial systems that would have told people where the plane was were shut off and then it fucking just deviates wildly off course. That'd be the biggest coincidence on the goddamn planet. Mm -hmm. So we need to accept as much as we don't want to think about it that this was done intentionally. It was not an accident and it was not a technical problem. Mm. And this quote um, is brilliant and I'm gonna steal it from Mr. Longavisha. So here we go, quote, by the time the airplane dropped from the view of secondary transponder enhanced radar, it is likely given the implausibility of two pilots acting in concert that one of them was incapacitated or dead or locked out of the cockpit. I said it was likely. Likely. As in, we can't possibly know for sure. Right. But since the two of them would have had to fucking agree that they're going to do this. Right. It's very probable that only one man was still alive in that cockpit. Oh my now, am, God. I say, am I saying the other person was dead for sure? No, I'm not. He could have been locked out because we talked about the fact that that security door would have kept people out for a while. Right. So it's extremely likely that one man did this acting alone. Oh my God. Much, if not all, of the electrical system was deliberately shut down. Okay, and we talked about how I know that because of the thing with the sat box on the plane. Mm -hmm. Per Mike Exner, who is an electrical engineer by trade and was a member of that volunteer group called the Independent Group, those independent investigators, he says the plane climbed to 40,000 feet during this first turn off course at 1.30 a.m., Mm -hmm. which would have caused an accelerated depressurization of the cabin. Mm. Everyone in the cabin would have become incapacitated within a matter of minutes and lost consciousness before gently dying without choking or gasping for air. It could have been a murder-suicide. Could have been. I'm saying it was. So you're, so you're actually saying that it was okay. in fact a murder-suicide. There is... Okay. We're going to get sued so hard. What I'm saying is there is no other scenario. And what Langovisha is saying is there is no other scenario that fits with what we know. Okay. Yikes. That's awful. So that first turn that happened at 1 fucking 30 a.m., based on what this engineer says from studying the data that we have, that fucking plane climbed up to 40,000 feet, at which point everyone who wasn't in the cockpit would be dead. 
Because again, those oxygen masks only hold enough air for 15 minutes. It would not be hard to stay at that height long enough for those people to suffocate if you're in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. The oxygen supply in the cockpit, as I said, is significantly better than those bags that drop in the cabin. There are four pressurized oxygen masks linked to hours of air. Mm -hmm. So it would be no problem if you were holed up in that cockpit to keep yourself oxygenated long enough for everyone else to suffocate. Mm -hmm. When the sat box came back online at 2.25 a.m., it is likely that the full electrical system was restored. And so this point seems like the most likely moment that the plane would have been finally repressurized. Mm -hmm. That means that for a full 55 minutes, the cabin would have not had sufficient oxygen to support life. After the final turn to the south, so once the plane again crossed the Malay Peninsula and reached the ocean, mm -hmm. it made a final turn to the south, at which point the plane most likely was put on autopilot. So that turn had to have been made by whoever was in the cockpit. That person had to still be alive at that point. Mm -hmm. And then the plane was put on autopilot. And again, the reason we think that is because of how straight the flight path appears to be based on that Inmarsat data, those seven handshakes. Mm -hmm. But there is one more piece of evidence suggesting that whoever was in that cockpit was still alive mm -hmm. up until 819. Mm -hmm. Along the seventh arc, after the engines failed from lack of fuel, MH370 entered a vicious spiral dive, and the descent rates in that dive may have exceeded 15,000 feet per minute. That descent rate strongly suggests that this dive was accompanied from within the cockpit. So it suggests so it that someone was dive. still alive. No, it wasn't controlled. It was a vicious oh, spiral. Okay, I understand. But whoever was in the cockpit was pushing the controls to drive the plane down faster, oh. to make the crash. I think that's what I mean by controlled. It was more like it was done on purpose. I think that's kind of what I meant. So that descent rate is very fast. It suggests that whoever was in there was still alive and was helping to make sure the plane hit the water with as much force as possible. Based on that descent rate and the debris found that has been identified to definitely be from the plane, the plane would most likely have disintegrated upon impact with the Indian Ocean. So there wouldn't be a wreckage. Not a whole wreckage, there would be pieces. Right. Oh, disintegrated. I'm thinking of a different word, I think. I mean, disintegrated means it'd be in pieces. Yeah. But we don't know for sure whose hand was at the controls in those final moments. It's speculation. But according to Langavisha, it was almost certainly Captain Zahari. This article in The Atlantic says unnamed sources told the author that Zahari was lonely and sad due to his wife moving into their second home. So these sources are saying no, she really did leave him mm -hmm. and moved permanently into their other house. They owned more than one home. She moved out and left him alone in the other house. Mm -hmm. He also notes, and this is a direct quote, a strong suspicion among investigators in the aviation and intelligence communities that he was clinically depressed. And by he, I mean Captain Zahari. Mm -hmm. But the most compelling piece of evidence... Oh, there's more. There's more. Oh, good. The most compelling piece of evidence is in the forensic examinations of Zahari's personal flight simulator. Oh my God. These examinations were completed by the FBI and they revealed a flight profile that roughly matches the fateful flight of MH370. Mm -hmm. North around Indonesia before turning south 
for a final run resulting in fuel exhaustion over the Indian Ocean. So yeah, odds are good it was a murder-suicide. And I might butcher this name, but I'm gonna go for it. Victor Ianello, who is also an engineer and a member of the independent group, has examined this simulation. And he notes that it was the only flight path on that simulator that Zahari did not run as a continuous flight, which means that he advanced the flight manually at multiple points, pushing it forward and running through the fuel until there was none left. Ianello believes this simulation was meant to be a breadcrumb from Zahari, a sort of final farewell to the world, acknowledging, right. yes, yeah, I, I did, did this. A fellow pilot who declined to be named, so again, he's an unnamed source, but he is identified as having been a lifelong friend of Zahari's, mm -hmm. also spoke with William Langavisha, and he said that Zahari's marriage really was bad, mm -hmm. and that Zahari had slept with some of the flight attendants that worked for Malaysia Air. Mm. Which, not necessarily, would have been a big deal, but Zahari's wife knew about the affairs. Mm -hmm. While his friend doesn't necessarily feel like, oh, a bad marriage is totally explains why he would kill himself, he's like, no, you do need to understand that these were probably contributing factors. Wow. And this friend does believe that Sahari did do So he's like, suicide. oh no, he did it. <laughs> he's not happy about it. Like it hurts him to know that his friend, sure, to yeah. feel that his friend would have done that. Right. But he does think that it's the only conclusion that makes sense. It makes me mad and I'm also sad. I mean, anger sadness is real. In February 2020, another story broke That's regarding- now. <laughs> Yeah, this just happened. It's perfect timing is after I already decided to do this. Another story has broken regarding MH370. Hmm. Former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who would have been Prime Minister when this happened, has said that the upper levels of the Malaysian government have long suspected that the flight's disappearance was an act of mass murder-suicide orchestrated by Captain Zahari. Oh shit! In a quote that was reported by Time, like the magazine, but I read it online, Abbott said, again, direct quote, my very clear understanding from the very top levels of the Malaysian government is that from very, very early on, they thought it was murder-suicide by the pilot. I'm not going to say who said what to whom, but let me reiterate, I want to be absolutely crystal clear. It was understood at the highest levels that this was almost certainly murder-suicide by the pilot. Wow. Wow, Malaysian government. Like, this just fucking happened. Wow. That's... That's batshit. Can you even imagine being a family member of one of the more than 200 people that was on this plane, and you've been wanting to know what happened, like, why your loved one never came back to you? And it turns out that probably from very early on, they had already reached this conclusion. I mean, and now maybe, I mean, it's because of the kind of person I am. Like if I found out that my husband, who's a pilot, who is an asshole, obviously, and cheating on me and blah, blah, and I move out. And then I find out that he deliberately crashed a plane. I would be like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, are you, what? And then I would guilt myself into suicide probably. But, oh my God. like. Well, I think that's the thing. Like, if you were his wife or one of his kids... Yeah. Oh, yeah, kids too. I wouldn't want to fucking believe this. No, I wouldn't want to believe either. I think I would do everything that I could to deny this to myself. That's true. I'd be like, no, nah, that's Because then how happen. would you fucking feel, like, walking around carrying that psychologically That would every destroy day? you. Yeah, I'd do the same. I'd be like, nah, that's not what happened. That's absolutely not what happened. That can't be what happened. I deny this. It's hard enough to accept it when someone you love just dies by suicide. It is. It's really It's hard. really difficult to accept that. It, it hurts. Yeah. But 
to have it happen in this way. That's awful. I don't, I don't even know how I would deal with it. I really don't. I think a lot of us probably would not deal with it. We would end up either suiciding ourselves. Yeah, I just said a word that doesn't exist. Or um, uh, end up in a mental hospital somewhere. I mean, I think I would. Okay, so in conclusion, there are many who believe the answer to the mystery of MH370 can only be fully solved by locating the wreckage of the plane and within it the plane's two black boxes. Oh, there are two. Okay. But those boxes, in reality, will most likely provide very little. Okay. And again, this is coming from the Atlantic article. I am not this smart. I do not know all the stuff about black boxes. Mm -hmm. I got this from William Longavisha. But the cockpit voice recorder, that's one of the two black boxes, is a self-erasing two-hour loop. Really? It can only hold two hours. I did not know that either. Which means that it is likely to contain only the sounds of the final alarms going off, unless whoever was at the controls was still alive and felt like monologuing about why he did this. Well, most supervillains love to monologue, so... Yeah, but supervillains aren't real. So because it's self-erasing and the plane stayed in the air for like six hours and 49 minutes after that turn off course. Whatever would have happened, like any scuffle that might have happened, we don't fucking, it won't be on there. Yeah. Doesn't exist. And if everything that they think they know is right, there should have only been one person left alive during the last two hours that that was recording. Right. And if he was smart, he wouldn't have said a word. As for the other black box, that's the flight data recorder, and it's not going to reveal any relevant system failure because no fucking failure, like no technical problem, explains what the hell happened to this plane. So at best, it's going to answer some relatively low-level questions, like when was the plane depressurized and how long did it stay that way, for sure. Because again, I gave you some estimates on that. But their best guess is they're not based on completely solid data because we don't have this black box. But the reality is, even if we fucking have it, it's really not going to tell us much. So if there is going to be any further information to completely resolve this, it's probably in the hands of the Malaysian police and the Malaysian government. So the only real hope that we're ever going to have, like a yes, this is what happened, is if we get further admissions from people like former Prime Minister Tony Abbott that might lay this to rest. Mm -hmm. And that's the super depressing mystery of the disappearance of Malaysian Air Flight 370. Here I was hoping it would be something like, oh, the plane just disappeared and we're never going to find out what happened to it like Amelia Earhart. Nope, it's nothing like Amelia Earhart. Yep, I was like, let's do something that's not a murder. It's kind of lighthearted. Nope, it's really not. Plot twist. Well, I wouldn't say lighthearted. I just wanted well, to have... not a murder. I just wanted to not do a murder. And plot twist, I did a huge murder. <sighs> Sometimes it turns out to be a murder. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> if you don't know, now you know, Mr. President. I was just going to say, so... <laughs> Um, anyway, reminder, if you want to try to stay on top of our fiction topics so that the things we say in the next episode aren't spoilerific, check out Twilight Zone Nightmare at 30,000 feet, and maybe also, just for funsies, Nightmare at 20,000 feet, the original Twilight Zone yes. episode, because we're going to probably talk about both a little bit. Yes. And if you do not have CBS All Access uh, for the new Twilight Zone, it is out on DVD currently right now coolio we have facts we have for you facts. that we got from other people and it's good the Boom. original obviously starred william shatner and the remake stars adam scott and that means guys when we talk about it i'm gonna use the shatner comma <laughs> Boom. <laughs> try editing out my pauses that week you can <laughs> good luck mate <laughs> Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to us. 
Please rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes of the Studying Scarlet podcast. If you have any cases or any criminals that you would like to hear us discuss on the show, please feel free to email us at studyingscarletpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can hit us up on any of our social media accounts. Those can be found in the description to this episode. And remember, guys, we talk about crime and criminals. Sometimes it's fact. Sometimes it's fiction. But it's always fucked up. Bye! Thanks to Studying Scarlet for the amazing episode. Check out the links in the show notes to subscribe. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social medias or at IndieDropIn.com. All the links will be in the show notes. See you next time.